of the second and final day of the, our caribou celebration. I just want to talk a little bit about what we did yesterday and this morning, actually. But uh, um, yesterday morning, we heard from the chair of the Porcupine Caribou Management Board about how, how what the Porcupine Caribou Management Board does is so so important and how it has evolved over time. Uh, after that, I talked about the connection between oil and gas and caribou and why we were having this uh, celebration because the porcupine caribou herd is uh, fairly unique in Canada right now and it being strong and healthy. And yet there are potential issues here with industrial development within the range of the porcupine caribou herd. And then in the afternoon, we heard from Justina Ray, who is the mammals co-chair of, uh, of the com Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And uh, she's also the uh, president and senior scientist of the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. And she talked about how Kosawick came to the conclusion that barren ground caribou were threatened and what it means. And what she actually pointed out was that a lot of the indicators would have warranted a more, more heavy duty listing than threatened, i.e. endangered. But uh, they uh, wanted to back it up a little bit because of, uh, I know, this is why I keep hesitating and I don't know why. It's the only mic that's on. Um, I'm going to turn this one off after I finish. Yeah, but then, uh, yeah, she's she's muted, um, but she's not off. Okay. Okay, this should be better. There you go. I thought she was muted. Okay, so there we go. It's because we're too close. Sorry, Margaret. Um, bear with me one moment. Um, so Justina Ray explained that uh, the porcupine caribou herd in some ways would have warranted a more serious designation than threatened. It could, they could, you could have justified in, to a certain extent the caribou being, the barren ground caribou being endangered because of the dire stra straits of some herds. But other herds are, are less uh, impacted, for example, the porcupine herd. And so they, listed it, they th recommended that it be listed as threatened. After she had presented. Then we heard from two caribou biologists, Anne Gunn and Don Russell. Many of you will be familiar with Don Russell. He lives here and he's worked with the Porcupine Caribou Herd, uh, Porcupine Caribou Management Board for many years. Anne Gunn is a, another caribou biologist that uh, is a colleague of his and they've been working together on caribou issues for many years and they both gave presentations that showed that um, how, how, caribou, how barren ground caribou react to disturbances and what that means. So one of the interesting things to me from the, those presentations was the way that they were able to, to translate the effect of, for example, a herd of caribou hesitating for a few days at an industrial development before they moved around it and what that meant to their body condition and how that actually translated in human terms uh, regarding fewer caribou, i.e. fewer hunting opportunities. So you could say that a certain road in the Northwest Territories they were able to show meant that there were 3,000 fewer caribou to hunt uh, in a few years' time, which I thought was very compelling. After that, we had a panel discussion uh, Brandon Kikovicic and Joe Tetlici. Uh, Brandon is from Old Crow. Uh, he's a heritage interpreter there, and he'll be uh, uh, presenting uh, um, tonight. Right, right after Margaret. Uh, sorry, I need an agenda in front of me all of the time. Um, I need one of those Google glasses. Uh, uh, Yes, so Brandon and Joe Tetlici and Justina and Joyce Majiski, who is an artist and biologist 
and Wilderness Guide, they sat on the panel and discussed about how uh, we can ensure that the porcupine caribou thrive into the future. And we had a great discussion between the panelists and uh, the people on the floor, the us. And uh, the consensus that essentially came was that the, the range of the porcupine caribou herd deserves a much higher level of protection. Ideas such as an international preserve for the porcupine caribou herd range uh, should be explored. Um, Larry Bagnall was here, so presumably this is going to happen really soon. Okay, so now it's time to introduce our, our speaker for, for today. Um, uh, we're delighted to have Margaret Najutli here to talk about and explain about her relationship and her family relationship with the caribou over the years and how they use the caribou in some ways. And she's also, as you can see, got this stunning display of handiwork that she has created. Margaret Najutli is a, a, a citizen of the Vantatkwichin First Nation. She's currently living in White Horse and she's uh, a member of the Fish and Wildlife Management Board. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the Caribou Celebration. Thank you for coming. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, tell you that this um, presentation is uh, in remembrance of my late mother, Joanna Jutley, and also um, my late sister, Alice Frost. And this is a pair of, this is her showcase here. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be up here at all, because as a child, I... Um, always sit and watch them so what else is there to watch there's no tv those days no computer and i used to spend all my time sitting and just watching them so and uh, i um, decided to just dedicate my retirement doing handicrafts and and i don't sell my handicrafts at all never it's too valuable for me i just like to teach, uh, you know, teach the world how important a porcupine cure bird was us, to us, the event at Gutch Inn. There's three different Gutch Inns. Gutch Inn simply means people in my language. So Julie is a Gutch Inn. She's a person. Um, I'm a Vantat Gutch Inn. Vantat means people amongst the lakes because in Crow Flat we have thousands of um, lakes there where we go in every spring to hunt and trap. And, uh, and then there's the another Gutchin. They're from Fort McPherson. They're called Tetlit Gutchin. Then there's the third Gutchin. They're called um, Gutchakoje. That's uh, the First Nations in Alaska. They're all scattered in Alaska, and we all speak the same language, uh, so we share that. So this is um, different languages throughout the Yukon, and um, as you can see, we have a big area that goes into Alaska or to end up lead team to McPherson and for the Yukon. We all speak our lang the same language. Uh, there's also, let's say, for instance, Pele Crossing and Little Salmon, they speak the same languages. And uh, I guess Northern and Northern Toshone and Southern Toshone, these, I could actually pick up their languages when they speak. It's almost, some words are similar. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And um, this is where the porcupine caribou herd, the barren, barren ground caribou, and there are thousands of them out there on the land. And we strive to live through the porcupine caribou herd every day for millennia. And we still do today. And the next.
next slide, please. So this is a um, part of the uh, migratory route from Tombstone to up to the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Next slide. So this is a uh, tombstone there. This is where the porcupine caribou um, they winter there. They would migrate maybe a thousand kilometers one way from Tombstone to uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and they would. Um, it's a long trek for these porcupine caribou. They would uh, go across mountains and creeks in the mighty porcupine river. Sometimes these caribou, they cross the river on their migratory route in the spring, crossing the porcupine river. As they cross the porcupine river, they would, sometimes the ice would break and they'll float down with that ice. And it's sad to see because that's a casualty right there. Next slide. So this is the uh, porcupine caribou. They're crossing Dempster Highway. They're just um, this is still spring, like they're going. Probably, they're just coming from their calving ground. They they, they completed their migratory route, and they're gonna feed and winter in the tombstone area. And as you see, this is a bull. In the spring, when the caribou um, migrate to uh, Anwar, the cows come first with their yearlings. Sometimes they carry their little ones with them, and then that's where they're born. And then the bulls come later. And when these caribou go past old crew or people's fish camp, um, they wouldn't touch the cows because they're carrying young ones just to re keep our numbers replenished in the, in the herd. And then the bulls come later. So that's when we harvest the caribou. And when, when, we, uh, when the guys hunt caribou, they only harvest enough for their family. That would last throughout from the spring to fall time. The caribou, would, they would live on that. And then when fall comes, they migrate like this. And then they get caribou again. That's going to last for the family for the winter. So we don't waste the caribou. And um, this part of the caribou is called when the caribou is um, skinned and everything, this part is called, um, can you put it on a, okay. So this is the sinew, and uh, it comes from the caribou. Could you put the caribou back on again, please? So it comes from the back strap, and that's, um, this is the sinew here, and you can put that back on. It's, um, it just, but what we do is dry the black back strap and we make little strands and this is how we put our our um, mucklucks and mitts and everything together. Um, also, um, out of the whole caribou skin, um, out of the whole caribou skin, uh, we would travel and the men would hang them, nail them to the outside of the cabin, uh, the skin side and the hair side to dry. And that's what we use for our bedding when we travel out on the land, staying in tents and stuff. So this is just an old photo I got from um, the archives. This is just a replicate of um, moose hide shelter, caribou shelter as well. And it's sewn together. And this guy is traveling. He's got his winter traditional clothes on. And he's got this mitt here with his mitt string. And it's similar to this one my mom made for me. And it's, this is um, a commercial rabbit skin. Sometimes we use uh, either beaver pelt to make hats and gloves. So that's um, then, um, so anyways, this, there's also snowshoes there that's just up there just to uh, prevent 
the wind from blowing uh, the canvas up, and then there's the tupac and beaning up to dry. Next slide. This is um, people are coming down from crew flats from their uh, spring trapping. They go out there and trap for muskrats, and uh, they would sell the hides and sell the hides, and then they would dry the carcass, the muskrat car car carcass. So that's what the dog would eat. The dogs would eat through the winter. We have to take care of our dogs too because they're working dogs. They commute, travel, and carry our belongings for, for the spring. And this is, could you put it back? This here is a canoe. It must be about two feet wide. It's handmade from scratch. And it, this is, I can tell this is made from a sturdy canvas, but long ago they used to make it out of hide, caribou hide, and all the uh, frame inside is made out of uh, birch. This is um, moose hide. They call it scow. It's a boat, and these families here, dogs and all, like I say, they're important. They, they're floating down from. Um, they came down from Crow Flats through the Crow River into the Porcupine River. And this is all, they're probably full of um, muskrats and our, their pelts and everything. Next slide. This lady is named, this is Margaret Black Fox. Her picture is out in the gallery. And uh, they called me after her. I don't know how she's related to me. But um, anyways, what she's got here, she's got her mitts made out of caribou skin, and she's carrying, the, these are just, she went out on the land to bring, uh, to bring wit into town and old crow, and she's gonna use that to, uh, next slide, and make, to uh, make fire in, under this little dome-like uh, frame cache. This lady here, she's, uh, harvesting, or she's uh, fixing up the curb that was harvested. It's all laid out on um, willows and leaves because there's no tarp those days. And what she's doing is she's just preparing all this meat for for the winter. She's going to dry them, and you could see some are cut and dried there. And she'll make fire under there. And same with this. This is just another replicate of. Um, a temporary shelter when people are travel on the land. This is not a very good photo, but it's similar to the last one. And this is their cache with all that meat hanging up. And um, she's got this lady, she's got the moccasins, and it's unfortunately, you can't see it good, but it's the style that she, She's got on. This is a working slippers for the ladies. And um, so it's just a, they, they call this a wrap. Next slide. Yeah, that's the one I just showed you. It's all made out of caribou. And this, another style at Style changes too as we create our sewing um, from one year to the next. So this, now this is a style that first came out. Um, it's beaded, they use different styles and it's to tie up here. And um, they use, this is probably suitable to go to church with or just go out and visit people. This lady, her name is um, Rachel Cattrall. That's my grandmother. Her um, husband's name was Dan Cattrall. He used Dan Cattrall. He used to have a trading post down the Porcupine River uh, on the border of the Yukon and Alaska. And she married him. She, um, she can't speak English. And Dan is a Scottish. He can't understand my language. So they got married and they had a daughter together. Can you imagine that? I don't know how they, 
stayed married, but they stayed married until he passed on. But anyways, her name is Rachel, and she was a Nitro before she got married. And uh, this is a homemade toboggan made from scratch. Of course, the basket is made from caribou hide. And the handle here, the toboggan handle, it's again made out of birch. And this is a, the wood is made out of log. They carve their own logs and they make toboggan out of it. And I guess in those days, you wonder how they bent the wood. What they used to do is they uh, make a big fire outside and uh, then they put a big four to five gallon on the fire and the water would boil and they put that a piece of wood in there and they bend it while it's soaked and wet and hot. So that's the way they made their toboggan. This is homemade harness also made from scratch and I made one. This is supposed to be a man's job. But, but as when I was about five years old, I visited my uncle in Old Crow, and I watched him make harness. He sat on the floor, and I sat to him and watched him make harness. That's how I know how to put this together. So what, what I did here is I put like a wire around here. And then this goes through the dog's head. So this wire is not in pack with the dog. And this is soft. It's cushions against the dog as the dog uh, pull a pile of wood like that or material. And, and of course, I put little bells there too. And that's probably, I gather, to like warn bears that were there too. Not only them is around. And so you just put this on a dog, and then this is, you would just snap this under the belly of the dog just so the harness could stay intact. And in those days, we live in, people travel on the land, they commute by foot, and uh, so we use dog pack. I made, this is just a replicate of a dog pack I made. What they used to do, how, how they made this a long time ago, is they would, they would prepare um, caribou, they would skin caribou legs, and that skin would, uh, they would make dog pack out of the skin. They, they have to cut the hair off the skin too, because if they harvest a caribou, they put, they put ham on each side of the pocket. The, um, the weight has to be equal to to both sides, so it's not no strain on the dog. And um, so, what do you think they do when um, you know hard to get water too? How do, would you keep that clean? <laughs> so, anyways, what they did is they just because it's they hang it up to dry and it gets pretty stiff and dried up and then they reuse it again. They just re it and reuse it again. Um, well, no electricity or nothing those days. And this is just, uh, I'm sure you saw a lot of this. This is a caribou shell that was given to me and you could see how this is woven. There's none up there of this, I don't think. So anyways, uh, it's just a cover of a park, and you will see a park later. This lady, my grandmother, she's got um, she's got her canvas boots on, and she's got um, caribou sole. And those days, climate change. With today, you can't wear mud clocks outside because you're you're going to get wet because of the snow. But those days, uh, we had dry snow in the winter. Next one. So this is another way uh, the women make clothing out of caribou. Uh, this is a, a little girl wearing a caribou uh, parka. And this one, this style has got the hair outside. But this one here I put together, uh, they would make parka with the skin outside. 
and a red ink is um, they, they would get that from colored rocks. It, it's called ochre. So that's that's just a design, and I just put this together just to see there's two different ways of making perka those days, and that that was me, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't remember dressing that way though, but. Those days we used to have maybe our weather is about 65 below in the winter, but now our weather is unpredictable. That's, I just talked about that. And we used, we used to ski too, cross country ski as recreation in Old Crow. Well, what else can you do those days? Yet there's no TV, long ways to computer wasn't even thought of. And look at the style we wear. Um, she's got, this lady here, she's got, she's got ski boots and she used a duffel that we will use in these muck clucks here, canvas boots we call that. And um, so these are just all my cousins from Old Crow. Can anyone guess who I am up there? <laughs> the shortest one. <laughs> Father Moshe, yeah, he taught us how to ski. Next slide. So this is just the canvas boots I was talking about. It's got a duffel, wool, wool duffel inside, which was store-bought. Um, you know, thank God for Christopher Columbus to come over and bring some goods that we made use of. So that's another, that's a canvas boots, the next one. And this is my mom, she just came from uh, checking her snares and she got um, a rabbit and then she's dressed in that, this kind of parka I just showed you and she's got fur around the bottom on the cuffs and she's got mitts like I showed you there and then she's got trimming around there. This snowshoes, it's also made from scratch and it's come from caribou, as usual. Um, the, of course, the uh, frame is that of a birch and this is what you call babiche. It's um, a skin that's clean on both sides, it's damp, and then you get someone to sit on your, stand on before you and, and um, I just need a volunteer to come up here. And <clears throat> got a knife here, and you have to use this to make babiche. <laughs> so let's pretend this is a whole caribou hide, and it's clean on each side. All the uh, debris and muscles and them is all clean. Are you whole? Is like this. Like this. Yes, tight. And then I would s sit on one end and stretch this. And then what you would do is cut this side and make sure you guide this with your thumb. And I thank you. Okay. So that's how we make babiche. And um, I remember sitting or helping my mother make babiche. She made babiche with one whole caribou hide she cuts them in circle, and it makes, and she made rope with it. We used to make rope out of that beach because we had no rope those days. And um, so the next slide, please. So this is the mitt my mom made. I just showed you there, and it's got. She used yarn to make a, a fancy. Mid string and those mid string come in handy when you're out hauling wood because you just tie it behind you and you don't lose anything out in the cold weather. This is a different style of parka. This material is called strout. I don't know how many, if you know what strout is, but it's just like a thin felt, but it's it's a strong felt and this is. Um, these are all beads, beads around here, and these are all woven decoration. And this lady dressed like she's 
ready to go out on a date. <laughs> that was me when I was 16. <laughs> okay. And this is my son. I made him this parka, and he's got canvas boots on. And he was playing outside, and he came in, and this is a, a big stove here. It was a um, 45-gallon stove that an old man and old crow used to make. He made stove for us, and he, we would buy it off him. And I had that there, and here he came in and warmed up by the stove. And luckily, those days, we had switch to put on, so we got automatic light. Otherwise, we used to um, sew with a um, gas lamp, coal oil lamp, or even candles. Next slide. This is a skin I was talking about before. It's a porcupine caribou skin, and they would just tie, uh, nail this to the logs, and it dries, and this is what we carry on our travel on the land, and it's our bed, we sleep on it. It's pretty comfortable and warm. And this is a pair of gloves um, my sister Alice made, and she, she used sinew to use, meet fine stitches around this. And she did the beadwork, I have a copy, one. Unfortunately, I miss one, one of this is missing, so I only could show one, but it's pretty comfortable. It's more for like dress, dress up, like going to church or weddings or whatever. And this is the bracelet that I made, and this is what I have got it on. It's just for going out again, go to church weddings or whatever, the next one. And this is uh, a sort of a decoration type um, scissor holder I made. It's just something you would hang on the wall. I try to use all my, um, my craft out of uh, caribou skin. It, it's traditional that way. I try to not use too much of these. Um, stuff like that, that the Western people came, brought over. Okay. And this is, I made a set of um, knife case, um, gun case, and shell case. These men used to um, go out on the land with them. Um, I don't think those days they made fancy stuff because they're quite heavy. So this is my uh, knife case I made. Belt go, this goes in the, through the belt, and this is the knife that goes inside. Then this is the gun case I made. And I don't know why I use this black velvet for my decoration. I could have just added this beads to the height. Um, but there it is, and I just uh, knitted a strand of beads to put as a handle. Then this is the shell case I made. It's weird, I made a shell case. Oh, okay, it fell. Oh, okay, sorry. So this is a shell case. People just put it over their head and go out in the bush and they, they would just reach in to get their shell and load up their gun when they're harvesting. And I, I just made it fancy just, just because I want to. That's how I was taught by my mom and my sister. So that's a set that the men use when they go hunting. And these slippers are the ones I, I've got on now. I, uh, this is beaver hide, like this beaver pelt. And everything is made out of caribou, and 
it's all decorated and it's good to go to church or weddings or outing. Pardon me? It's hard to get all that work done when you go to weddings and churches. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to tell you, I work as an interpreter in a tombstone for four years. We work uh, eight days in and six days off. And on my days off, I stay up there and I do my handicraft and I just replenish that way. And I'm going to continue to do so. Okay. This. I was working for Parks Canada once, and we just travel around for par for Van Tat National Park Open House. Uh, Van Tat National Park is just a park, uh, just other side the Thousand Lakes I was talking about earlier, and um, I bought this in Inuvik when we went there for our open house. This is made by one of the Inuvit Inuvil um, Inuits, and um, they make pretty fancy decoration. These are just individually sewn together and you, it blends in, you can't tell the difference. And this is just an extra um, knife case I made too. Sometimes I, when, it's a, when I finish a product, I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, well, what am I gonna do next? So I just, pick up a pair of hide and you notice if you look closely you won't see one pen mark on these because I, I uh, just use my head when I do my design. It's called hands on I guess when you, you don't use pattern. And this is the uh, the purse I made is it's a hand purse. This is a hand purse that I made with, it's a shoulder strap. And 50 years ago, I wouldn't have added this onto my purse because we had no cell phone those days. <laughs> and inside, I got it all filled with some goodies. People say my eyes glow when I see money, so <laughs> I made a wallet. Then I made um, a little chain purse for my pennies. And then I made um, a credit card holder. <laughs> so, any questions? Before the questions start, I just want to say thank you so much, Margaret. This is thank such you. an incredible and beautiful display of, uh, of craftsmanship. Um, it's really interesting. Hi, Margaret, you were talking about um, the parkas, and sometimes you made it with the fur out or with the fur in. Did you ever make... Um, mucklucks with both fur in and fur out, so the fur in would be more insulating and be warmer? Um, I don't, I never heard of such a thing, but what I forgot to mention earlier is uh, when you saw my mom out there with, um, from coming in from her sneer line, she had a rabbit. Of course we eat the rabbit flesh, but what do you think they use for the, the fur for? the outside skin. We used to just dry it, the rabbit fur in. We dry it and then we wrap it around our foot and then put these on. So we keep ourselves, our foot stays warm like that. So I'm glad you answered that. Ask that question. Uh, everything we harvest we eat and then we use whatever, utilize whatever um, that's left in any way we can. 
Margaret, I have a question here. Um, in your grandmother's day, I know she didn't order the beads online. <laughs> Where did she get the beads from? Uh, which, which one again? Did your mother, your grandmother, make beading? beading? Um, yeah. Well, my grandmother, she made more stuff like like these with, or like this. This we used to make this with caribou leg. The, the height of a caribou leg is all dried up, sewn together in uh, parallel, and made nice mucklucks out of it. And then, if you're to prevent your foot feet from getting wet, you know, there's no over wrappers or gum boots. You know, people live on the land. How do you think they keep their foot dry? They would use animal oil. They would uh, melt the fat of an animal and apply it on the outside, and it works. I remember going out to Schaefer Lake uh, trapping one time, and we went to one of our old camps, and I found in my grandmother's old pair of uh, boots in that at the site, and that was what she did. You. You could see the oil applied on the outside. Um, I, I can actually add to her question, if you don't mind, Margaret, about the beads. Um, okay. Then, um, well, yeah. these beads, they came from, obviously, from the Western people when mm -hmm. they came over. Before yeah. that, they used to do their, make their decoration out of porcupine quills. Yeah. Yeah. They used porcupine quills. They also had beads, too. They called it nakai, and yeah, they still say nakai. It comes from that. berries, the seeds of certain berries, uh, silver berries, I think they called them, or something like that. Those beads, those berry seeds, got a natural hole right through the middle. You don't have to drill it or anything. They, they used to color them. They used to have to put them in a vat of water, hot water with berries. And then they, I can't figure out what it is, but they had to add some kind of green stuff to it to allow that dye to latch on to the seed. I think, it, I think it's some type of algae or something they had to add in with it when they boil it and they could color the beads that way. And they used to decorate their clothes with porcupine quills, but those nagai, they used to make what they call nagai ik with it. That's a bead vest. They used to use that bead vest to count a person's wealth. Oh. It was a system of currency. Mm. Yeah. Which, uh, are you from Fort McPherson? Um, ha, Brandon Kikovicic, I'm from Old Crow. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. because we say nagai for beads as well. So you're like a, then you're a tetlet kuchin if you're from, or kucha if you're from Alaska. <laughs> but um, yeah. I forgot to tell you about this. This is my late sister Alice. She made this, this uh, park jacket, and I treasure it because, you know, I, if, like I said earlier in my earlier speech, I wouldn't be here without them because I even sit in front of candlelight and watch them sew. And sometimes in those days, like I said, we get long winters, no, not much to do as kids. Um, so what we do is just visit commu the whole community as kids and just watch people. They're, they're just like our movies. We stand by the door and watch them like old couples. We listen to them have a conversation. And sometimes they give us food, like maybe panic and some delicious stuff. And um, out of the caribou, I remember on one of my visits, I watch this old gentleman. He he skin a caribou leg, and he also even skin the foot, the hoof of the caribou. He cut up the knuckles, and as he did, he chew all the muscles on the knuckles, and then to make bone grease, you keep all the bones, especially the caribou legs, and those knuckles I just mentioned. You pull those 
all day long, and they make they pile up fat as all the fat comes out of the bone, and that's what you make bone grease out of. And for chitsu, that's pem pemmican, that's just like our candy, and it's really hard to come by those. So we utilize the caribou in every way, and it is very important for us to uh, preserve our caribou out on the land. Um, I'm doing this because I thought of the Peel River watershed. They're attempting to do development there. And this is where our caribou live too. We got clean water there. And um, I'm also worried about Arctic National Wildlife Refuge because that's where the babies are born. They, they're replenished and um, then for, especially for the porcupine caribou herd. So um, that's why I just dedicate myself to sewing. And um, I just wrote a little blurb here. It says the porcupine caribou was and still is the gift of our lives and should be protected by the government of the United States. The, um, all the Republicans, especially the Republican senator in Alaska, um, prevent Anwar from any development. We urge you, President, to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and set this beautiful land a site as a protected area for all time's sake. So I hope this message will go to uh, the Republicans in the United States and because us First Nations throughout NWT, Yukon, and Alaska, we depend on the porcupine caribou herd. So that's the reason I donated my time here and dedicate my time to use the caribou hide and show the world that we do depend on our porcupine caribou herd. So with that, I just want to say thank you for coming and spread the message around. Brand Brandon Jekovicic has a huge act to follow. Um, but uh, I've had a sneak preview of his, uh, I'm going to call it a presentation for lack of a better word, and uh, um, I, think, uh, I think he's up for the, char for the task. Brandon is uh, a heritage interpreter uh, for the Vantad Gwich'in First Nation, where uh, you were born there? I was raised there, yeah. Raised there. No, no, no. We're all we're all born in Whitehorse now. Yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, yes, it's my pleasure to to introduce Brandon to you. So uh, um, I'll turn on his mic. That's it. Drink on greensy. Shosri Brandon Kikavichik Raji Rantat Gwitchin Dichu All Crow Gutsat Dichu um, Good afternoon, my name is Brandon Kikavichik I'm Rantat Gwitchin and I'm from All Crow um, What I did for you today is a little different than your regular speeches uh, I've done a ton of them at this point, I'm getting kind of bored of them so um, I did something a little different this time so what I want you guys to do is to imagine that we're up in Old Crow at the top of the Yukon and we have omniscient powers. We can float above the landscape, we can rewind time, we can fast forward time, we can reposition ourselves, we can do whatever we want basically. I want you guys to imagine that I'm there with you. I'm not standing up here talking to you I'm with you because we're all in this together. We're on the same battlefield together. And I'm tired of standing on these stages talking to people. 
I want you to imagine I'm in it with you and I'm experiencing it with you for the first time, just like you guys. So I call this Ndo Treta. It means we move forward, a journey with our caribou brethren. This journey begins in present day northern Yukon, 140 kilometers above the Arctic Circle, where the tundra is a connected fabric covering the landscape and the permafrost is the foundational flooring that holds it all up. At this time of year, in this part of the world, the sky turns to a pinkish orange and silvery hue as the sun sets late in the evening. Imagine that we as a group are hovering over this Arctic landscape with seemingly omniscient powers at our whim. We float high above the modern day town of Old Crow Yukon. We turn ourselves so that we face Crow Mountain and we begin to hover toward it. As we fly over Crow Mountain on our way to Crow Flats, we realize that it's not evening, but midday. Below us is a large expanse of lakes and feeder creeks, all connected to Crow River which connects to the Porcupine River, which connects to the Yukon River, and so on and so forth. The wetland we are flying over is called Van Tut and Gwich'in, and is where my people get their name from. We come upon a large lake and begin to descend on it. As we get closer to the lake, we begin to see tiny spots all over the lake. One side of the lake in particular is absolutely trampled with these spots. Descending closer to the lake, we see that they are caribou tracks from a herd that has recently trampled an entire shoreline of this fairly large lake. As our gaze is sharpened and the edges of our pupils expand and contract, we begin to make out other elements of this ecosystem. There are other types of animal tracks, many of them. The tracks are all crisscrossing each other like Los Angeles road infrastructure. All of a sudden, we see movement. It's not an animal, but a human. He has shut down his snow machine and is walking past the trampled area toward a well-worn track. He walks along the caribou trail, examining every detail, like the story of this animal's final hours have been written out in the snow. He takes his rifle out of its beautiful beaded casing and sticks the stock of the gun into the hole that was made by a single caribou's right hoof. He moves the stock of the gun around in it and taps it against the northern side of the hoof print. As he taps it, we can hear that it is hard and crusted. He points north to his fellow Gwich'in hunters that are caught up in the chase, just like he is. He points north and says to take out a map. He puts his finger to the map. They're going this way, to the farthest end of Schaefer Lake, he says as he jumps back onto his skidoo and takes off. He follows the tracks northward to the northwestern edge of Schaefer Lake and Crow Flats. There, the caribou wait for their brethren. One of the hunters has a faint memory of the moment, as if, as if it had happened before. The memory was more like residue, though, little bits of consciousness left over from a dream or premonition. The leader of the hunting party stops his skidoo a ways away from the herd. He knows it's best to walk into the timber with snowshoes. They adorn themselves with their handcrafted hunting snowshoes and tie their beaver fur mitts behind their backs on the strings specially made for the purpose. And they walk into the timber, rifles in hand. When the leader gets out of the timber and into the meadow the caribou are feeding in, one of the caribou gets his scent and gazes curiously toward him. They look at each other for a few brief seconds before the caribou turns its side toward the hunter and gives itself to its brother. Rewind the clock now about seven years. We are looking down at a younger me in a boat on the Porcupine River. I am with a friend. He is driving the boat. We are hunting, it seems. We drift in closer to take a good look. My friend is looking earnestly, his eyes and movements as sharp as you've seen on any person in the history of humankind. I should be watching the river, but I seem to be fixated on his apparent ability that has been sharpened since a young age. I see that when he first spots something moving, he was actually looking at the other side of the river. All of a sudden, he turns his body a full 180 degrees to the right and says, right there, as he points simultaneously. Look, coming down off that hill, right there. You see the whites of their necks? You see them? 
As I look at the small herd of caribou coming down off of the hills, we begin to transport through time again. We rewind another 10 years. I am with my cousin, my best friend, and my grandfather. We are trying to drag a canoe full of stuff up a demon of a hill on a hot day. We, we had canoed there, and now we had to get over this hill, and we were home free. That was not a fun day. We watch as the younger me struggles and struggles and struggles. My cousin and I begin to curse a lot. We curse everything in existence. My grandfather takes me by the hand all of a sudden and looks deep into the souls of all three of us. It's okay. I've been through worse lots of time before. His voice could calm a startled jackrabbit. Now we begin to backtrack again, but this time just a mere three years. I'm 12 years old with my grandfather hunting caribou in the early spring while there is still a lot of snow on the ground. My grandfather had tracked the caribou into the timber, through the timber, and then all the way back out of the timber again when we finally came to their feeding area on a big meadow. He stops the elan a ways away. I sit there a bit anxious, worried we are going to scare the caribou away. My grandfather seems to know what I'm thinking, as grandfathers always seem to do. He puts his hand on my shoulder and says something very softly. Right now, wind is good, blowing right way, he says. You see, wind is not blowing toward them. They can't smell us. Long as you don't move around too much and you don't make noise, Caribou won't know we're here. He walks up to a tall willow and pulls off a couple branches. He takes the excess branches and leaves off so that what he is left with is basically a long, skinny stick. He does the same with the other willow branch. Now he cuts grooves into the willow sticks until each stick has these lines cut in rows across the shaft of the willow from one end to the other. He begins to rub the willow sticks together and sneak slowly toward the caribou. His knees constantly bent and his back crouched. Every time a caribou would look at him, he would simply stop moving, except for the willow shafts constantly rubbing. The clicking of the grooves cracking together, making the clicking sound of caribou hooves, giving the caribou the impression that my grandfather is just another caribou. When the caribou looks away to continue eating, my grandpa starts sneaking toward them again. When he gets close enough, he takes a shot. When the caribou lands on the ground, it hits tundra that is thousands of years older, and it's not a bullet that took it down, but the projectile spear from an addle addle. It has run a long way since taking the spear in the gut and has now laid down to die. The Paleolithic hunter whose spear is in the side of this caribou is hot on its trail tracking it. He has tracked it all the way from the grasslands to one of the rare stands of timber in the area. Fast forward now a few centuries, maybe more, maybe slightly less. Who knows really? But it isn't long before bow and arrow technology is invented. This practical invention spreads quickly through the vast trade networks that are now developing amongst these ancient northern societies. Eventually, everyone on the continent uses bow and arrow technology. Fast forward a few more centuries, we fly over the canyons to the Yukon Flats and beyond. Eventually, we see mountains to the north and south of us. One of them is called Denali by its people today. It is a large Arctic mountain indeed. As we peer down to the confluence of two large rivers, we see that there is a congregation of people. We get ourselves closer to see and hear what's going on. Once close enough, we hear people talking vigorously. They wave their hands in the air and appear to be very animated. We get right in close next to a man and his wife who seem to be trading with two other men from another tribe. The automated translator turns on for us and we are now able to understand what they are saying. I have something new for you, my friend, the man with the wife exclaims. I call them snowshoes. If you wear this, you can walk in the deepest, most powdery snow as if you were walking on solid ground. I invented it myself. The husband then gets a scolding from his wife, who gives him a good charley horse in the arm and clarifies that it was her that designed the stitching, which the darn thing wouldn't even work without, she adds. The husband straightens out like an arrow shaft. Oh, yes. Gee, you did a good job on that. 
Didn't my wife do a good job on that? He says to his friend as he tries to save his behind from the wrath of a very capable woman. From there, snowshoes as a technology spreads along the vast trade networks, each pair of snowshoes tailored to a specific environment. As we float higher into the air, times begin to time begins to fast forward again. As time fast forwards, we see that many new Arctic inventions are being developed and spread in this manner. Rafts become birch bark canoes, homes become warmer and more efficiently designed, dogs begin to be used for labor and as pets, and trails that connect the communities become more heavily worn by the caribou skin moccasins of the people that frequent them. As time continues forward, we see that the life cycles of the societies within this vast territory begin to revolve around certain areas. It seems these areas have become well known as refuge for large mammals, migratory birds, and fish. We descend on the landscape to get in closer for observation. As we descend on one of these communities, we begin to notice that the people are far off in the distance and there is not as many of them as there, were hover as there were when we were hovering in the sky. We look up and see that there are only a few of them perched on the ledge of a large hill, peering off into the distance with their hands above their eyebrows. We zoom in quickly to the top of the ridge and see that most of the people from the group are down below in the valley. They seem to be constructing something. We drift in closer and see that they are creating a barricade of sorts. We fast forward a little bit again and reposition ourselves and we can see that groups of people are running in deep snow with snowshoes. They are yelling and waving their hands in the air as they run. We widen our gaze and see that they are chasing caribou over the ridge and toward the barricade they constructed. Once the herd is within the barricade, the people can harvest much more than they could otherwise. We hit the fast forward button again. Now we can see that there are structures being built that are similar, but larger, with more complex structural elements. The yearly cycles around these barricades, called tsaf by the people, begin to get more consistent. The life cycle of the society stabilizes to a certain degree. They build what can only be described as villages today. Each village has one tsaf or more that they maintain and operate. As things begin to stabilize and become more consistent, we slow down the forward motion of time just enough so that we can perceive the nuances better. We close in on a specific thuff, referred to nowadays in English as caribou fences. We see now that the yearly cycle of this society begins at the caribou fence village in late summer. Now we are literally standing on the ground my ancestors are living on experiencing everything in real time again. There are old ladies sitting together sewing. They scream out in absolute genuine laughter in unison. The little girls sit around them and watch intently as they, sew, as they also sew themselves their very own little practice projects. Crude mini mitts and little mini boots that the little girls are proud of nonetheless. In the distance we see more people most of them older ladies and young girls. They are weaving spruce roots and willow bark into rope. Some of the older, more experienced weavers have already started weaving the braided roots into waterproof cooking vessels. We zoom in closer to them, and when we get there, we see something else in the distance. Middle-aged women pulling huge piles of moss back toward the caribou fence. The moss, it seems, will be used for many different things. You can see women cutting the moss into squares once they are dropped off in a pile beside them. A huge group of women cutting moss carpets into squares. I wonder what they use all that moss for. We float back up into the air quickly and notice that there is something moving way, way off in the distance. We, we move toward the group. As we get closer, we see that there are people down there busy at work. We zoom in for a better perspective. They are elderly men. They are all crafting things out of lumber. As we look around more, we can see that some of the old scouts are chopping trees down with adzes. The more we look around, the more we see that all they have is handcrafted tools made out of things in their surrounding environment. They have taken the timber from standing right down to lumber that can now be used for building. Another thing we notice is that it is not just elderly men, there are also some boys in their youth. They are all singing their beautiful songs as they work. 
One of the young boys is working very closely with the elderly mentor. The mentor is pointing at a long strand of twisted and dried caribou skin that is tied to a tree on one side with big rocks holding it tightly stretched out so that the other side is held tightly on the ground. The old man is explaining something to the boy. The translator kicks in again. You see, when this fin is drying out, gonna be strong. Caribou have hard time to break. We take this twisted, stretched caribou skin, and this is what we make in the snare. You see, the whole inside of the pocket of the caribou fence will be filled with these snares. Caribou head going to go in this noose, this antler and all going to go in. Noose going to tighten up. Once it do that, you got him. You finish him with spear or arrow. That's it. That's all it takes. The old mentor says as he tugs on the twisted caribou skin, as if to prove his point about its tensile strength. You learned a lot today, my boy. Tomorrow, we're going to go way up on the mountain, get good perspective of everything up there. I go and show you the land good. You go and see everything good from up there. You learn even more than you did today just by going up there, looking around and hearing the stories. All of a sudden he jumps up and begins to rush the kid off. We have to move now. Hunt, hurry, go. We have to get back to the caribou fence. When we look to the distance, we see what must be a very large fire has been lit in this, on the summit of a large hill. The fire must be telling the old man something. We fly over to see what the commotion is about. When we get to the bonfire on top, on the hilltop, we see two men standing around looking toward the mountain range. We see a herd of caribou. The two men yell out some very indigenous sounding yells and hug each other very tightly. The caribou have arrived. We look toward the caribou and quickly zoom in closer. There are more people, a hunting party of sorts. We speed up the forward motion a time a bit and soon we see the hunting party working together to herd the caribou out of the mountains. We float back up into the air and see that a group of old, the, the group of old men that were harvesting the lumber are now rushing back toward the caribou fence, pulling the lumber they have ready. We decide to go back to the caribou fence and get a good look. When we get there, we see that everyone is gathered around an old man. He raises his hand to the crowd to speak. The caribou have arrived. The crowd of people yell out in ecstasy. We rise back into the air and increase the forward motion of time. As we ascend higher and higher, we can see other fences in the distance. All the people like little ants. They all move and work in perfect unison with little vocal communication. Everyone seems to know their jobs expertly, moving to and from and all about the fences, pulling things, twisting things, lifting things, building and designing things. I notice that the next caribou fence over doesn't seem to be in operation. It seems that there is a group of people around it that are shutting it down. They put blockers around the pocket of the fence and take down all the snares. We speed up time a bit and track their movements. They migrate to the fence we were just at, where the caribou arrival was announced. When the group gets to the caribou fence, we get in closer to hear the conversation. As we descend, we see an older gentleman walk up to the old man that announced the arrival of the caribou earlier. I'm assuming they are, they are the leaders of these two groups. We get right up next to them just as they begin to speak. The translator kicks in just in time. Nili Kukti, you old dog, it's good to see you. The elderly announcer of the caribou's arrival says to the other leader as they walk right up to each other, and hug very tightly without interruption for much, much too long of a time. That was awkward, guys. Sorry about that. It was a different time back then, you know. Looks like they are telling each other jokes in their ears and laughing together. The other leader that we haven't quite been acquainted with yet speaks to the other old dog. Chewalti, what in that which we depends name are you doing in my territory? I sent my best runner to you, but I didn't think you would come. You mean to tell me the great medicine man Chewalti had to shut down his caribou fence? Really? The greatest medicine man in the country and you shut down your fence. What's wrong with the world these days? Oh, that's enough now. 
Who do you think brought the caribou practically right to your door? I was going to walk them right into your roundhouse, but I didn't want to scare you to death. I know how squeamish you are. Nali Kakti gives Chewalti a death stare. Chewalti returns the dirty look. Once again, this goes on for much too long. All of a sudden, Chewalti smiles and they give each other another ridiculously tight hug and laugh out loud. Nali Kakti speaks. You know you're always welcome here. That's why I sent for you, my friend. We have people drying meat already, and I have my best runners herding caribou out of the mountains as we speak. We speed up the forward motion of time again, just enough so that we can simply watch the process they go through to get the caribou into the fences. Once the harvest is finished in the late fall, they dance, celebrate, and have competitions and games. There is smoke bellowing out from little smoke sacks everywhere we look. The people are busy drying their meat and fish. We slow things down a bit and we notice that they have weaved willows through the dried meat and fish and they have stacked them up, one willow frame on top of another, and tied them together to make bales of dried meat and fish. Much of it is going into underground cellars. They have harvested and imported very large logs to frame the inside of these cellars so that the walls don't cave in on the meat and fish. We notice that uh, the, the Chewalti village is all packed up and ready to go. They are all equipped with caribou skin toboggans that they will pull to their village themselves. Every family also has five to seven uh, pack dogs that are used as pets and for labor. Chewalti has a string around his chest holding the string in front of him with both hands. The string is the same twisted caribou skin used for snares. It is connected to a toboggan full of dried meat and fish. His dogs are howling. He yells at them to be quiet. We listen in as he and his good old buddy Nali Kukti send each other off on their travels. Well, Nali Kukti, you old dog, thank you for having me. This will help my family through the winter. My good friend Tsikwat got to marry that nice lady from your village too. Thank you for that. Yes, Chewalti. My brother, it was a good harvest this year. I'm sure Tsihkwat and Nihte will be happy together. Makes a fish. How did he get that name anyway? You don't want to know, brother. Look, I wanted to tell you something, my old friend. Ever since it started to get dark at night again, I've been watching the moon and the stars. I think it's going to be a good winter. You saw the boy in the moon too at the moon celebration last week, when we celebrated the full moon. We could see the boy in the moon. Good, you saw it too. It's going to be a good winter. The thing is though, something is coming, my friend. Something different. Something I really don't understand. When I dreamt myself to that herd of caribou, the one we harvested in the beginning of the season, you know, when you sent for me, there were two caribou together. One was pure white, the other was pure black, and they seemed sick. I never saw the white and black caribou in person when we harvested the herd. I still can't figure out what it means. Be on the lookout for anything strange, my friend. If you see anything strange, you send your fastest runner to my village to tell me, okay? Nali Kakti doesn't nod or say anything in, in approval. He uses his eyes to answer his old friend. As we rise back up into the air, things are beginning to make a bit more sense. The caribou fences are all connected. They are connected by villages that work symbiotically. As a net, it's a networked unit. The higher we get, the more we can see further off in the distance. As far as we can see in either direction, there are these fences. We speed up time and just let it go. We see the highways being constructed and mines of all types begin to scar the landscape. The fences have long since fallen into disuse and are now in ruins. But what we can see sheds more light on this mystery. The fences stretch from Arctic Village in Alaska right to Tsikechik in the east. When we were in the old times, every Gwich'in citizen was tied to a caribou fence village in some form or another. Even if they didn't live at a specific caribou fence village, they still had to work for the caribou fence village to get the benefits. It was like a large interconnected manufacturing system. 
In those times, the role humans played in the symbiotic nature of the ecosystem was much more pronounced. The extremes on both sides of the animal's population cycles were more stabilized. There wasn't as much overusage of certain areas by the animals that caused the subsequent population spikes, which in turn inevitably caused the population dips. This cycle is actually much more vicious at its, at its extreme than subsistence hunting is on the populations of harvested animals. In fact, the hunters, fishers, and trappers of the old days kept the cycles more stable by using the ecosystems to a certain degree. The people that were living in this paradigm were well aware of the role they played in nature. Rewind time back a bit again. We are now a couple decades earlier when Daco elder Charlie Peter Charlie is still alive. He sits on top of a large hill looking out over the landscape. He is wearing some type of microphone and there are people recording him. He speaks the Gwich'in language, the only language he spoke for the first 20 years of his life. The translator kicks in. This land, all of it, the whole country, the elders kept it good for us. All the work our grandparents and great-grandparents did, they did it for a reason. They were giving future generations a foundation. That was my generation. Now, my generation is trying to make a foundation for the next generation. You see how it works? That's how it's been passed down for thousands of years. My grandparents and great-grandparents made a foundation for us. Now, I want to make a foundation for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. When the elders did things back then, they were smart. They knew what they were doing. All that ancient knowledge got passed down to them from the beginning of time. And then it got passed to us. Now, we pass it on to the next ones. That's how it's always been. When the old-timers harvested muskrat, they kept it good. They kept the country good. The more they use it, the better the country is. This is true. The more they use the country, the better they keep it. Same for caribou, marten, mink, everything. It's a cycle. In the old days, the Vantat Gwich'in, they followed the caribou to the calving grounds one time. They say, me, I'm not Vantat, but I'm part Vantat, though. My grandfather, Netru, was a born and bred Vantat Gwich'in from Crow Flats. Plus, my grandfather, Tetlichi, they call him Chichi Viti. That, that, that's the first Tetlichi. That's where all the Tetlichi come from. Him too, he was raised in Crow Flats. He was orphaned when he was a child in the headwaters of the Porcupine River. They call it Chu Klit in Gwich'in. It means water's end. A man that owned a caribou fence in Crow Flats took my grandfather in and raised him after he was orphaned. So I know about Van Tutgwitchen history too. They say the Van Tutgwitchen tribe went there. They followed the caribou trail from Driftwood right past Chewelti caribou fence to the Arctic coast. Somewhere around Shingle Point, they say. They say there was a big trail to Herschel Island that time. It was a walking trail. People use it to trade with the Inuit. From there, they followed the coast of the calving grounds. They lived amongst the caribou a long time. They watched them and learned from them, but they harvest too. That's why Van Tutwitchen know lots about caribou. They say the first one to follow caribou to calving grounds was Chewalti. He was medicine with caribou, they say. He dreamed to them. We quickly rewind time and reposition ourselves so that we can see Chewalti returning to his people after living amongst the caribou on the Arctic coast. The movements of his body are strange and twitchy. He seems almost animal-like. An elderly lady approaches and speaks softly to him. Grandchild, we've been worried about you. I'm glad you're back. Nobody knew where you went. Come. I'll feed you. We fast forward a few decades and we are at the confluence of the Porcupine and Crow Rivers. There is a large communal fish trap in operation. This is a prime location for a fish trap to catch the fish migrating to and from their rearing grounds and crow flats. 
we see that a convoy of canoes lands ashore. A pale gentleman in a black gown with a white collar walks up to what looks like the leader of the fish trap village. The missionary begins to speak to the older gentleman. Detrukavitik, my old friend. Or do I just call you old man crow now? Well, I guess detrutenyachi it is then. Looks like the fishing's been good this year. We would like to purchase some of your succulent dried fish and beautiful dried caribou meat and caribou tongues if you have any. Sorry to say, all we have to trade right now is tea and tobacco. No ammunition, no beads. Sorry, my old partner. Look, I know you need beads as a currency so you can trade for things you need from other tribes, and I promise, once the Hudson's Bay Fort is on its proverbial feet, I will be able to trade much more of the beads and ammunition you require, as the church will be able to purchase these things from the fort, so that I can trade for meat and fish from you. So, do we have a deal? Old man Crow answers his old pale friend with his eyes. Great! You're really doing your church a great service, my friend. We shan't forget this great deed. Now we begin to rise up higher and higher. Our journey through the ages is coming to an end. Time flows forward at a fast pace, like a river through a canyon. We see a town begin to take shape near Old Man Crow's fish trap village. The town takes its name from him, in fact. When we get to the present day, we find that we can go no further. So we rewind, and we rewind, and ascend even higher into the sky to get a satellite's perspective. As time rewinds, the town disappears. The fences that were once in ruins are erected and disassembled until they disappear completely. Waterways and wetlands get larger and larger and begin to rush backwards and pool up into a giant lake as the Laurentide ice sheet forms directly east of it, where modern-day Tsike Chick and Fort McPherson are today. Now we are looking down at a gigantic lake. In modern times, we refer to this lake as Giant Lake Old Crow. Much of it will flush out westward, connecting the Porcupine River to the Yukon River, and all of the rest of it will be soaked up like a sponge by the tundra. The top layer of this tundra, called moss, will one day be used by people as flooring and butcher shacks, where the women could butcher the caribou, and the square moss floor tiles can soak up all the blood and guts, and they can later discard the blood-soaked moss. In this way, they will keep the area around the caribou fences clean. We let time rewind until we are sure we've gone somewhere in the millions of years in the past. Giant Lake Old Crow has all but disappeared. Then, all of a sudden, it begins to form again. Millions of years in the past, we look down once again at a beautiful giant lake. The ultimate destruction, refilling, and redestruction of this lake will someday create wetlands that will be the most important ecosystems to land-based mammals, fish, and waterfowl in the area. The ecosystem will someday be home to a society of people utterly devoted to the understanding of this complex relationship. These people pride themselves on accumulated animal knowledge. They have a powerful belief in our connection to all living things, to all matter in the universe and further into the celestial world. This connection to the outer worlds gives them the belief that they have telepathic abilities with certain animals, especially the caribou. They are the bloodline of ancestors that at one time had refined their way of life to suit an Arctic environment impeccably. They were the result of thousands of years of perfecting one's abilities in an Arctic climate and most of all, in survival situations. These people have suffered much, but the relationship they have with their brethren, the caribou, has gotten them through the darkest, most hopeless times. Now that our journey is over, I have taken this time to reflect. I see all the connections clearly now. They say in the old days, the caribou and Gwich'in were relatives and could easily communicate with each other until a split was inevitable. When the split happened, Caribou and Gwich'in people exchanged a piece of one another's hearts. I believe this is the way our telekinesis with the Caribou works. This story captures perfectly 
and the symbiosis of this relationship. The caribou need us, and perhaps most of all, we need the caribou. The two have been involved in the dance of survival for thousands of years. It was this relationship with the caribou and all things in existence that allowed the ancient Gwich'in people to prosper in such a harsh environment. When we saw caribou mothers lick their young clean and nurse them to quench their thirst and quell their hunger, we saw that they weren't much different from us. That's why even today, children are taught to never make fun of animals because the Gwich'in are connected to the animals just like we are connected to the land, the water, and the celestial region. The animals will hear you when you speak badly of them. Sometimes, when you're out on the land, if you sit and listen closely enough, you can hear them trying to communicate with you. They communicate not with language, but with the brush of its paw against your shoulder, or a grunt that echoes from all directions. When we saw my friend hunting in the boat on the Porcupine River, he was looking at the other side of the river when the caribou let out a breath of air that brushed against the right side of his neck. That's why he shot around to the other side of the river and saw the whites of the caribou's necks coming down off of the hill. Gwich'in people are forever tied to the caribou. There are many Gwich'in people out there today who feel like there's something missing in life but they just can't say for sure what it is. It's like something was ripped away from them at a time when they couldn't retain their memories yet, but the residue of the experience lingers. And we wonder, what is it that dragged us away from that which we depend? When we get too far away from the caribou, we get separation anxiety, like we are infants without our mothers, and most of the time we don't even know what's eating us up inside. So what do we do? Well, usually what you'll find is that we latch on to the other side of our extended family, our Gwich'in brethren. We love to get together and dance and celebrate. Our ancestors laid a foundation for us to continue this connection and to seek out harmony with one another. This harmonious paradigm is called Gwiyin Ji I Hluk in Gwich'in. It means one mind. During the last days of the caribou fences, Gwich'in people had refined the art of an Arctic existence to its absolute highest standard. Thousands of years of evolution completely devoted to hard work and discipline. They were Arctic martial artists, as or, I, or as I like to call them, Arctic ninjas, baby. The life cycle they endured cannot be duplicated by anyone alive today. The thing is, they couldn't have done it alone, and they weren't alone. They had their animal brethren, along with their vegetative, hydrological, and celestial brethren. Every aspect of this ecosystem and beyond providing a specific function so that the unit as a whole could operate and produce at an optimum level. When we as Gwich'in people are looking down the barrel of a gun, focusing on lining up the site as we are about to shoot, we believe that the caribou on the other end of that site knows it's going to die. The caribou has already agreed to offer itself up to its brother or sister as a sacrifice. So when you go beneath the surface and you go right down to the roots of this relationship, you can see that the caribou wasn't just our food and our shelter and everything we needed for sustenance in life. The caribou were, are, and always will be our family. And when you're family, you make sacrifices for one another. It's just how it is. I will end this with a saying I got from Myra Cho. It means Big Myra in English. She was my grandfather's stepmother. She said this in 1979 when she was 95 years old. Shitche ye no tai nto tre ta kukon tri nto tre ta ton chu. That means, grandchild, long ago, we moved forward through much difficulties. We carried on, that's how it was. We carried on, that's how it was. Fleet ha, masit.